Well, hi there, everybody. This is Rich Cedarberg, EXP Realty Agent in Albuquerque, New Mexico, here with another Tuesday morning hangout um, for just hanging out, talking real estate. I'm real excited today to be joined by uh, a great, great panel of guests, some regulars, um, some kind of half regulars, and uh, Mr. Bobby Carroll, who's going to talk to us all about what makes a good real estate website. But um, before we jump in with that, why don't we just go around the room? the, the uh, virtual room here, if you will, and everybody take uh, 45 seconds, maybe 60 seconds to introduce themselves. So let's go ladies first. How about you, Karen Highland? Hi there. My name's Karen Highland, and my husband and I, Chris Highland, are a team in Frederick, Maryland, which is in Central Maryland. And we've been, he's been selling real estate for 20, over 21 years. And I joined him after raising a few kids and uh, we're having fun. And um, you're, you're, you've got the best part of the partnership, at least in, <laughs> I think, from my point of view, which you are the uh, internet person, marketing person, correct? Yeah, that's correct. I get to play on the internet, and he actually gets to um, do most of the buying and selling and dealing with the clients. So I get the fun part, I think. Actually, of course, I love both parts. I love doing 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 everything. And Mr. John Wake, tell us about yourself. Hi, I'm uh, John Wake. I'm a real estate agent in Scottsdale, Arizona, and I'm a real geeky kind of guy. If you like real estate numbers in Scottsdale or Phoenix, come by my website, Arizona Real Estate Notebook. Yeah, John, uh, you're an economist. That's your background, correct? Yeah, yeah. So I, I always like finding the secrets buried in a pile of numbers. Secrets and insights uh, in a pile of numbers, right? Yeah, yeah. Excellent. And uh, Mr. Dave Keys. Hi, I'm Ooh. Dave Keys. Um, I help people gain visibility in organic search, uh, otherwise known as SEO, and my focus is on real estate websites. That's about it. I help people get visible. Excellent. We all want to be visible, and uh, um, that's an important part of having a good internet presence but you know I'm I'm visible but I'm not sure I'm highly visible in my market but uh, my phone doesn't ring as much as I would have hoped it would considering you know just how visible I am and so I'm really interested to hear what we're going to talk about today with Bobby um, so Bobby take a minute and actually you know take a couple of minutes and tell us all about yourself mm -hmm. tell about yourself tell us about your background how did you get into this business and um, you know, uh, take it away. Thank you, Rich. Appreciate the opportunity to be with you guys here today. Uh, I'm Bobby Carroll. I'm with Dacno Marketing. We're, we are a full service real estate marketing firm. We're located here in Raleigh, North Carolina. I'm sure you've already been able to tell by my accent that I'm a North Carolinian. Um, but uh, love all things related to digital and old school marketing. Um, just a little bit of trivia about Bobby. Um, a lot of folks don't know that I actually am a licensed agent. Uh, I've been licensed in North Carolina since 1985, so I'm an old guy when it comes to this whole real estate game. Uh, stayed around in real estate for uh, about three and a half, four years, and then found that I needed to get a real job. So <laughs> I, um, that was back in the day when interest rates were 17, 18%. It was tough as Chinese arithmetic to sell a house. So um, got into marketing game in the airline industry. Landed, uh, landed at Delta <clears throat> and stayed with Delta Airlines for about 20 years. Took an early retirement, dabbled a little bit in medical device sales, and then my son, who is the owner of DACNO, invited me to come to work for him for half the rate of pay that I was formerly getting, and I said, where do I sign up? And so uh, I've been with my son, Brad. We've been teamed up here at DACNO since uh, he started the company in 2000. I've been here since about 2004 and uh, just had a great time. So I'm about 10 years here at DACNO uh, this year, and uh, we're all things uh, real estate marketing. So all we cater to is real estate industry. So all things real estate marketing, not just websites. Exactly. So we're here to help with PPC, with social, with, uh, you know, uh, Dave can tell you all about local SEO and ratings and reviews and things like that. So, yeah, we dabble a little bit of everything. Okay. Um, t terrific. Uh, thanks so much for joining us, Bobby. We're we're excited to have you here, and I'm sure 
um, just like the hangout we did where we featured Dave. Um, Key's talking about SEO. I'm sure we'll get a lot of views um, after the fact of this this hangout. Um, yeah. Just because of your your name recognition and the great work that you guys do at DACNO. So, uh, but before we get started on that, I just want to talk about a couple things briefly. There's been a lot of chatter over the internet on the last probably two or three days about what is Google doing. Uh, maybe a week or two weeks ago, I'd start to hear people say, "Wow, um, results in search are as volatile as they've ever been." Mm -hmm. and, and that was maybe two weeks ago, and then. Maybe two days ago, I heard or started seeing posts like, "Is this uh, a new version of Hummingbird that's coming out? Is this a refresh of Panda? Um, what do you, what do you guys feel like going that is going on?" Let's start with you, Bobby. Well, you know, um, these algorithms are are not static. They're they're there to help accomplish Google's mission. What is Google's mission? It's to serve up the best results for relevant content that the, that the consumer wants. And so it's constantly looking at how to tweak that to make that better. Uh, what does that mean for the real estate agent? What does that mean for the real estate industry? Well, I think that if it were me, I think Dave would agree with this. Keep your nose to the grindstone and keep doing things in a white hat fashion. Keep doing all the things that you need to do in terms of creating great content. Share great content and get it out there. Uh, play in Google Plus. I mean, you can't go wrong there. So, yeah, I, I agree with you, Rich. I've seen some of those mentions, uh, you know, the, the Danny Sullivans of the world, you know, the, the David Amerlin, say, uh, Eric Inge, and some of the guys there at Stone Temple. They've all been following this. I, it may be a little early to sort of put a label a, around what the algorithm change is. But you know what? I think that if we're just doing things the right way in terms of creating fresh content, I don't really see huge monumental swings in terms of results. Yeah, do you, do you agree with that, Dave Keys? I always figured if I wasn't, you know, just trying to totally game search results, you know, if I have quality content on my website, that I would be at least somewhat protected from these changes. Is that a safe assumption? That's a pretty safe assumption, um, and this whole. Volatility in the algorithms is kind of like when if you've ever gone to a play and you're sitting there and the curtain's drawn and you see f shadows and feet moving around and you're wondering what's happening behind the curtain and they're setting up the stage and everything. And then when the curtain opens, you're like, oh, I don't know what all that was because the stage looks pretty regular. And, and, you know, Google does this for two reasons. They One reason is that they may be getting ready for a Penguin update, and so they're testing and retesting. Uh, I've got a little background in database development, and I know that, that when you're going to roll something out that you test uh, you know, you test in a closed environment as much as you can, and then you start getting the real environment ready for that rollout. You do little tests to see how things are going to react, and then finally you do your rollout. And the the hopeful result is that it goes very smoothly with little noticeable effect other than the, exactly what you're looking for. And so we may be seeing a bit more now than we actually see if they do roll out Penguin, which is a little bit overdue. Um, and but, but they're hunting for the bad guys, and uh, if you know, we all you know, I'm I'm a big believer in link building, and but I'm very cautious as to how that's done, and uh, the, you know, the people using black hack tactic tactics and automated software and those kind of things is who they're after, and mm -hmm. they're trying to make sure they make a clean cut when they do it. And so you may be seeing some testing just to see, okay, what happens if we do this? How will the cut go? And, and other than that, I mean, almost everybody watching this now or any time is not even in that arena, and there's nothing to get excited about. Um, you, you do keep doing what you're doing. You do keep increasing your um, your uh, marketing approach. That's a lot more important is what is my message, what's my marketing approach, and what am I doing that differentiates me from competition? Excellent. So that's that's what we're going to talk about as soon as we uh, start talking to, to our featured guest Bobby here about what makes a good real estate website. Um, one other thing before we get started on that, Karen told uh, told us that she's going to Retso here on June fourth and fifth, I believe. And uh, there's probably some people who've heard of that, Karen, and some people that haven't. I would love to go. I'd love to see internet friends and you know, just be in the room for the presentations or and maybe even more importantly in the hallway 
um, in between presentations or at the you know local watering hall afterwards. Tell us about Retso and um, what you're, what you're hoping to gain from that experience. Okay, yeah, we went uh, for the first time in 2010, and it's it was different than anything we'd ever been to. Um, it's very fast paced, and you just go from room to room to room. Um, there, there are three basic tracks that they have. The, um, I, it, it's hard to really break it down. It's more like, um, you know, it's not so much beginner, intermediate, advanced. It's um, things you can do right now, and then things that are intermediate, and then things that are long-range planning kind of things. And I, I think that's fantastic the way they've done that. But the first year we went, um, we basically got two really good. There's a lot of good, but you know, when you go to these things, you should always like have a couple of takeaways that you're actually gonna commit to. And the two takeaways for us that year were video. We took the a, cor a class with Brian Copeland, who does some amazing stuff. He's down in Nashville, and we came home, got a video camera, really started really focusing on those videos, and that's that's been a really good thing for us. And then the other thing was I picked up. Um, that whole thing that was going around then about blogging 365 whatever your city and so I started my blog 365 Frederick and um, that has that's just done really well too so I'm really looking forward to um, you know just honing in on a couple of things that are really going to be strong that I can take back and you know run with yeah it's, it's always good to leave those events and be kind of uh, reinvigorated and uh, enthusiastic and to get kind of charged up. Yeah, so, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. See, so we, you just have to have family in other parts of the world where they're having these great conferences. That's how you get there. <laughs> oh, I can, well, I come from a very small family. We all live in, oh. you know, here in New Mexico and in Chicago. Nothing ever happens there. Oh, <laughs> no, wait a minute. Tons of stuff happens there. Why don't I go? Because I'm showing houses and meeting with sellers. So uh, let's talk about what makes a good real estate website. When I approached Bobby about this, I was like, you know, my I said maybe we could talk about structure. Maybe we could talk about, um, gosh, I don't even remember some of the technical stuff behind um, what makes a real estate website run. And Bobby's answer was kind of like, no, Rich, you've got it all wrong. We should talk basically about what do consumers expect when they land on a website. Um, so this is the discussion, although probably overlap with SEO and some other things, is really going to be geared toward do you have, you know, what people want to see on your website, people who are looking to buy, people who are looking to sell. Um, and so, Bobby, in your job at DACNO, do you get involved in the technical aspects, aspects or are you just more looking at these marketing um, aspects? I've actually managed the build-out process in the past, um, which helps me build sort of a, 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 an acumen there, uh, Rich, of you know, what it takes to build a successful site. And of course, having you know done what Dave's done in terms of accumulating data over years with using testing tools in closed and open environments, A/B testing, we're able to uh, you know assimilate a lot of good data and see what are what are the actual design elements within a real estate website that work, that are getting clicks. And so what we're, we're looking at is, you know, what are these engagement opportunities? Sure, we can have best practices for navigation, we can have best practices for layout, and, you know, and of course design is always changing. Design, you know, the, the thing now that's really big is these big images, you know, impressive images. And so, Sites like uh, Airbnb and Pinterest and other sites like that have had a huge influence on design, but we can never forget what are the motivations of the people that are coming to the site? What are they coming there for? And so I always start that conversation with people that are thinking about designing a site and tell them why are we going to discount all the years and the data that has been uh, accumulated from sites like Trulia or Zillow or Realtor.com when we know that what they do is position some you know, caveman simple quick search tool right at the very top of the site. And so that's really the, where we start those conversations, Rich. Caveman simple tools. I love it. Um, yeah, you know, and I have caveman simple tools at the top of my website. 
and yet, Bobby, I have content, and I'm like, I wish, I want to put that form at the bottom of the, the home page so people see all the great content, well, if I do say so myself, you know, all the great content that I have there, but really, people, when they land on your website, that's what they want to do, right? They're there pretty much for for one, maybe one or two reasons, right? To, to search for homes or right. to find out what their home is worth. Is that pretty much yeah. it in a nutshell? You nailed it in a nutshell. So I would, you know, and there's this popular thought process that I think that um, the folks at Keller Williams have done a really good job, and that is focus on one thing. What is the one message, what's the marketing message that you want to send to the consumer when they land on your site? And so the overwhelming response is that they gravitate toward that quick search tool. So the simpler you can make that quick search tool, make that above the fold. If people don't know what above the fold means, that's basically an old newspaper um, adage that basically says anything that's above the crease of the newspaper, that's what drives the highest revenue in terms of ad sales to a newspaper. Well, the same term is used in online marketing and web design. So the things that are most important, you want to place those above that scroll bar so that we know if we're building a website and the, the majority of the people that are coming to that website are buyers, let's place front and center a quick search tool right at eye level so that they can hit that to they get to the site. Right, but, um, <clears throat> you know, we've talked about this before, you and I and, of course, with the, the guests here, um, on our panel, uh, you know, long tail searches, and yep. sometimes those search forms don't lead to, they're not real conducive to, to getting people to drill down on their searches and look by, you know, micro areas and, and high schools. Is that, do you, would you agree with that? Well, I would. So what's the, what's the corollary, what's the, what's the complementary content that goes along with that quick search tool? And I agree with you, Rich. I think that um, offering the ability for people to click a button that can view homes instantly, or maybe you have maybe you have some sort of widget that creates a showcase of of properties that um, you really need to figure out what is the best showcase in your market. And let me give you some examples of that. Um, what's the what is the um, what is the uh, current inventory like in say your your market? Um, uh, Karen, what's happening in terms of inventory there? Well, our inventory has been very low for okay. all of last year. Of course, this year it's um, it's creeping up. So, okay. but it's at one time new listings were probably a really hot commodity in your market, right? Right. Okay, right. so having some control over your homepage that basically could plop down a call to action button that says "View all new listings in Frederick." That I can imagine at one time because of low inventory, that would be a very compelling button to have on your site. So to Rich's point, it, it might be that that long tail search result might be for the latest listings, new listings that are coming on the market because if you're in a market that has lean inventory, buyers are going to gravitate toward that, that button because they realize that that's, I, I got to see what's available. If I don't, I could miss a home of my dream, so to speak. So, or another example might be a couple of years ago, foreclosure homes, right? Everybody wanted to look at those. That would have been the, the thing to, to put on the home page, the, the feature. I, I agree. So here's, here's some intelligence that every agent needs to think about in terms of the design of their site. They need to think about the market opportunities that are present right now in their marketplace. So if they know that inventory is lean, and they know that a call to action button that says click here to view all of the newest listings coming online, then that's probably a smart button to have integrated into your site. There could be uh, other buttons that are long tail oriented that might be uh, in a market where maybe 55 plus uh, buyers are really prevalent and you're actually targeting those, those uh, folks like a Kathy Sparrow Bell up in Delaware. She would want to target you know, uh, the 55 plus community, well, she would want to have maybe a button that says, view all homes with first floor master bedrooms. Because we know that as we're older, getting older, we don't want to trudge up and down steps. So maybe we have a button that says, view all homes with first floor master bedrooms. Or maybe a, a popular last lifestyle amenity might be golf course homes or oceanfront homes. Or Just think about in terms of your market, 
and what are the best opportunities, what are the most popular ways that you know buyers want to slice and dice that MLS data. And so you might want to configure your site based on that, plus have the flexibility to change that at a moment's notice if you realize that maybe new home construction is popular. Right. I have a question. I have a question specifically about that. Now, naturally, I would think create a page or a blog post about that, and then from that button, link to the blog post. Do you think that's a, a strategy, or do you just create the page in your IDX and link to that? Well, I think that there's there that's a viable option there, Karen. But what I would say is minimize the number of clicks that it takes for that that site visitor to get to that piece of, of information. That that okay. whether it's a blog post or you know I, what I've done here at DACNO is create a page where there would be really good copy based content in the page to let Google know what the page was all about because sometimes these IDX search pages they don't get they don't get all that much Google juice. So what we do is we we actually write a page of content about this relevant to that particular search. Then we RSS feed the listings into that page. Okay, and so the, there is that instant gratification of being able to see properties, but uh, some explanation from Google's perspective of what that page is really all about. So I think that's kind of a best of both worlds approach. Great. So, yeah. I got a question as well. So, uh, Bobby, you talked about the images at the top. I just had a, a theme where it had a huge image at the top. It looked spectacular. I thought, this is using up so much real estate. So I just changed the theme that was a smaller image at the uh, top. And I'm thinking, why should I really get rid of that image <laughs> and put the content up even higher? Well, what do you feel about the image? Is it the one thing it has got the, the emotion of the image versus pushing all my content down? Well, one of the things we're finding, John, that's an interesting comment, is that, uh, l let me ask you this, John, when you go to your tablet and you now scroll through a web website, are you willing to sort of use your finger to scroll through that particular site on your iPad or your Droid or whatever? Yeah, pretty much. Okay. I think, I think there's a proclivity for all of us as consumers of content to be willing to scroll. So it used to be that everybody would just say, oh, page scroll is horrible, it's terrible, you need to eliminate page scroll because, yes, we do see a diminish of site visitors staying on a page as it does scroll, but I think, I don't think that's as huge a problem today because I think the, the tablets have sort of mitigated that. And so what we're finding is, yes, there will be a fall off in site traffic as your page scrolls, and you certainly want to have the most important um, calls to action at the top of your site. And, but I would be real careful to not have sensory overload of offering too many compelling calls to action at the top of the site. Then the whole site loses hierarchy. It loses design hierarchy. So now we're confusing the site visitor because now we're asking them to click on 10 different click points. And do you know what the response is for a site visitor that is, res that is presented with 10 different click points? you know what their response typically is? The Never back away. They go away. They hit the red X or they go away. And so my, my suggestion to all you guys and gals out there, if you're configuring sites and you're playing with themes or you're getting some redesign or a new design is go back to my original point. Think about that quick search tool, put it at front and center. I, I love the idea of the hyper-local content. Rich, we hadn't even talked about that. One of the major discussion points or talking points of buying a home is where is that neighborhood? What does it offer me? in terms of amenity and lifestyle. And we're making those decisions based off of those neighborhoods. And so offering some button or drop down menu that says, view all our neighborhoods here, take a look and take a tour of all our neighborhoods, that's a very compelling button for buyers as well. Um, you, you threw a term out there and it went by pretty fast. You said design hierarchy. Yes. Um, um, maybe some people, I mean, I, I think I kind of know what that means, Tell it, but I'm not sure probably some basic uh, points about that that I don't get. Can you talk a little bit about what does that mean, design hierarchy? What are the most important design elements that are going to be in your site and, and ascribe some level of priority in those, Rich? And so for me, if I'm building a site, the, the quick search, and forgive me for sort of being on a, you know, a bandwagon about that, because I go to so many sites and I see a button that says, start your home search here. So now I'm being forced to click a button to go to a subsequent page where I will perform my search. When shouldn't it be easy just to do that right there in the middle of that home page? And so I would think that, and maybe have a, maybe the next priority in terms of design element would be um, that hyperlocal content. 
or maybe it would be search in a town by price points or by lifestyle or by that long tail search result. So, or you know, how about my telephone number so people can call me? I think that on my list of, you know, <laughs> design hierarchy, that's number one. You know, and I, you, that's the things that we overlook. And so, definitely at the top of the, the banner, like all your contact information, um, simple, easy to use, horizontal based navigation. I'm I'm not real crazy about multiple navigation, uh, you know, primary and secondary because I think that gets disjointed. It, it causes you to have to make decisions in terms of navigating the site. I like a primary main navigation. I like to have some drop down menus. I'm not real crazy about this whole uh, child. You know, you so you have one drop down and then a spider out. You really oh, get yeah. problematic with a lot of you know older you know older visitors who can't control their mouse and so they're having to kind of do this daisy chain effect of, of navigation. You want to avoid that. Yeah, I've always been frustrated by those. Those don't work. But here's yeah. my question for you, Bobby. This is all great. We're talking about content on the page and yada yada. You know, 50% of my searches come from mobile devices. And of course on the iPad or a tablet device they're going to see that content. But on um, you know phones, they're not. Why do I even bother then to have that page content if mobile is going to surpass desktop usage? And does that just totally change the game? Well, I'd be real careful not to sort of broad brush say that you know in, in a lot of markets that mobile, it, by and large, it is going to get to a point where it exceeds desktop. I agree with that. But there are still markets where the users are, are dependent upon their desktop and their laptop. So uh, I don't want to use a broad brush approach to that. But yes, they, your site should be mobile compatible and mobile friendly. And so uh, here at DACNO, we actually use a combination of breakpoints with response and uh, with some fixed design because we know that we want to control what we pr present to the site visitor when they arrive at the site. And some totally responsive sites tend to push down priority design elements that um, need to be front and center with the site visitor. So we here at DACNO we take a little bit different approach in terms of total response. We actually build breakpoints into our mobile sites so that we're making sure that the most prominent design elements are front and center when the when the visitor gets there. And again, you know, you want to make sure that not only is the search tool mobile friendly, but the results of that search search tool are mobile friendly as well. And I will tell you for the most part, uh, we we build IDX solutions here, Rich. Uh, IDX Broker does a nice job in terms of mobile friendliness. Um, uh, Diverse Solutions does a nice job. Um, by and large, most of the major vendors in IDX space do a really nice job in that. Some are playing a little bit of catch up on that right now, but for the most part, they do a nice job. Seems like most of them have have caught up, or they've really mm -hmm. fallen by the wayside. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, great points about mobile, and we could do a whole hangout about you know what what mobile is going to do to search, but. Um, you probably just don't want to want to go down that path. Let's talk instead about, you know, I think on my website I'm a WordPress guy, mm -hmm. right? So I did my own stuff, and you talk about design hierarchy. I'm like, well, I guess I left that up to the theme designers. Um, you know, it, it's hard for me to go in and uh, change the fonts, and and I don't know, am I supposed to do inline CSS or not? Right at that point, I kind of throw my hands up in the air and just say, well. Geez, I'm just trying to get found online, but I, I've kind of mastered that. I'm I'm found very well in my local market, but again, people aren't picking up the phone to call me um, at the rate that I would want to. And um, something that you and I talked about yesterday before, while we were planning this hangout, was like, are you communicating your unique, uh, I guess, marketing proposition? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and how can we do that? I don't even know. I don't even know where to begin. Well, I think it's um, it's definitely content related there, Rich. And so I would say that um, make sure that that design also uh, actually meets other expectations for your site visitor. And that could be things like, what's happening in the market? I mean, isn't that the conversation starter in the street when when you're at the grocery store or at the Starbucks and you meet somebody and you know them and they know you? What is the first? What are the first words that are coming out of their mouth? Well, we all know it's, "Hey, Rich, how's the market?" Well, I think you need to address that on your website, and that can differentiate you. And I'll, I'll toss this to Karen. So, Karen, in your market, the way you can differentiate, differentiate, say yourself. Excuse me, I can't even talk, and be the subject matter expert 
is through those market updates and market reports and providing solds and providing days on market and things like that. Isn't that one of the, the ways in terms of content that really segments you in the market? Yes, yeah. Actually, um, I've even had responses from some of my readers over the years. I mean, there are those people who love the statistics. And, and I've always qu questioned myself, you know, that's real geeky. I'm, I'm like you, John. I love to I love to read into the numbers and I love to um, spell it out and say, and, and that's often fodder for my blog posts, like, you know, a blog post about days on market. What does that mean to me as a buyer? What does that mean to me as a seller? So those are even great fodder for blog posts. And um, But I found there are those people who like that stuff as well as all the other stuff. I think that's why we you know, we kind of have to be uh, well-rounded and um, just think of everything that a buyer or seller wants to know, really. Well, that would definitely make a good real estate website, wouldn't it, to be well-rounded. But maybe <laughs> on the home page of our sites, it doesn't need to be 750 words about the local market conditions, including mm -hmm. supply-demand ratios versus absorption. But just a simple answer to that question, Bobby, how is the real estate market doing? Yeah, ask me how the real estate market's doing. Boom, that goes to maybe a landing page where you have an RSS feed of your latest post that you've written about the market. Or maybe there is within that, that landing page the ability to click and view sold properties or something like that because let me tell you something. Karen's right. There are these data geeks that are consumers that will spend a lot of time on your site. And we're talking, you know, like five, six minutes a page. And so if you're really looking to add depth, uh, one content uh, idea would certainly be those market updates and sold data because I, I literally have seen us create those projects of sold data by neighborhood and by, by uh, condo building and they just cause time on site to leap, they cause page views to leap, so that's a great, great content to consider. What, one of the things that I hear you saying is um, and maybe I'm reading into this, I think the navigation is probably, I need to work on that on my site because I know I've got all this great content but I'm not sure, you know, other than people finding it through a Google search, I'm not sure once they get on my site they're able to go to all these places. So I kind of am hearing you say the navigation is really important. It I is, it but I, I want to I bring Dave Keys in this conversation because one of the things that we over fixate on for all these agents is you think that everybody ultimately is going to your home page and that's not necessarily the case. They're finding you through a, a whole plethora of keywords that may or may not drive them to your home page. So while I, I, I think this conversation is certainly critical for design of the home page, we don't need to over, uh, you know, fixate on the home page because we just have to remember that if we're creating great content out there, guys and gals, they're finding it on those landing pages so, and, and on those, you know, those long tail search results pages. So, Dave, you might want to just speak to that, that, you know, not everybody is coming, in, entering your site through your home page. Uh, one of the sites that, let's make sure I'm on here. You're uh, good. One, one of the sites that I recently built, um, the majority of traffic does not come to the home page. And it uh, created uh, a great deal of consideration of how the page looks that people were landing on. And it was a response to optimizing a page for a particular search that has a lot of traffic volume. Um, people go to the internet according to a recent study by, I think it was realtor.com, they go back to the internet somewhere between 11 and 19 times before they buy a home. Um, now Bobby mentioned a particular search and I, I keyed it into the other computer here that was uh, view all new listings in Frederick, Maryland. Is that Maryland, right? And so I, I put that in and I saw truly a realtor, realtor, Zillow, homes.com twice, three times, Weikert and Redfin, not one local result, uh, not one uh, Google local, all branded websites. So I went to the first one which was Trulia and picked a house that I thought I liked to look at and Trulia assaulted me with a survey by 4C. So I had to click that away and then I'm given a box where I can contact newhomesource.com with a little graphic of a house. I haven't seen one person. I haven't seen one thing that says here's a reason to trust this website. So what do a lot of people do? They leave 
and, and they go somewhere else on the internet and they may not even be aware of it but they are looking for you mm -hmm. and the big differentiator in this game between everybody here and the the big aggregator syndicate websites like truly and Zillow is that there's a person at the helm and people like us who people go and look for and, and you know sooner or later they're going to say who can I trust mm -hmm. They're going to ask questions. They're going to start reaching out to connect. Um, I did another search uh, about schools. You know, maybe I've been told by somebody you want to go and make sure you buy a house near Liga Liganor High School. It's rated nine on great schools. So I go and I change my search: Frederick, Maryland Homes in Liganor High School District, because I want to make sure I buy a home in that district so my kid can go to that high school. Now I have a whole different set of results, a completely different set. Um, there's opportunity there. There's opportunity to talk to that person where their need and where their emotions are. And Bobby talked about data on websites and people, how long they spend on that data. And a lot of people do that. But even those people, the buying decision is emotional. And one of the things that that data hounds like to do is talk about how analytical they are because they like to be seen as smart. This is an emotional reaction to information. Is I want people to see me as smart and so I'm going to talk about how much I look at the critical data and you might but when you walk around the corner with your real estate agent you see that house for the first time you make a snap decision based on something that's not data it's emotion and that starts with the real estate agent and starting to meet the agent and and uh, um, Rich I'll say that that is your unique selling proposition um, and I'll end with this one more recent ad I've been hearing is that 90 percent of people work with the first real estate agent they come in contact with that's that's kind of important like what happens when they come in contact with you now, I, I get abysmally low traffic according to a lot of metrics on my website and that website feeds me leads all the time to the point that I have to choose who I'm going to work with and who to turn down uh, because it's about meeting me, the star of the show, um, like it or not, pretty or not, um, I'm the guy that they decide they can trust. And it's the same thing for everybody that's watching this that's in the real estate business is that people are have a great need to find an agent whom they can trust. And that's where you make the difference between all the big sites that spend millions and you simply bringing authenticity to the table so that they can trust you. Hey, Dave, can I ask a question getting back to uh, what Rich was saying about getting the phone to ring and putting the number? Do you have any tips on how to get the phone to ring because having that information of about what for sale that's really they're looking for data on homes or those people aren't necessarily looking for a real estate agent well they so, may not be but they need one uh, I well, may be looking for information on cancer because I think I have it but really I need a doctor and sooner or later if I'm sane I'm going to choose a doctor I'm going to go to the doctor and say you know I feel something I've never felt before and I need to have a scan um, now that's a negative uh, approach, but the idea is if you need something enough, it doesn't matter, um, you know, how much you want to get information. You need to go see the doctor. You need the real estate agent, unless you are just a self-punishing glutton for pain. Uh, you're going to need an agent to help you through the process of buying a house because it's more complex than other. Um, yeah, but, but the point I'm trying to make is that. It's an intervening thing to look at homes for sale. That's intervening. The real point is to get them to call you. So yes. I'm just trying to get, is there, is there a way to short circuit that somehow to just have them uh, make the call? Uh, I guess we're talking about it by talking about neighborhoods or something more specific. But anyway, that's the goal yeah, is to get the call. This is counter to branding. I'm going to let Bobby address this. Go ahead, Bobby. Thank you, Dave. Um, so the magic question of the hour is uh, I'm a real estate agent and I want my phone to ring. Um, and here is sort of the anecdotal evidence of what we've seen to make that happen, guys and gals. So I've got one agent here in Clayton, North Carolina. He blogs his fanny off. I mean, the guy is a content-generating machine. So that, to the point, 
that he blogged about a local Harris Teeter grocery store opening near a subdivision that he really promotes. To the point that people were calling him, asking him, where do I send my resume to get a job at the Harris Teeter? Now, that's kind of backfired, but I, I love it, the fact that people think he's the subject matter expert for that community. And he knows everything to the point that the local town planner says, if you ever need any help, David O'Doherty, I'm your guy to help you because David is like the goodwill ambassador for this little community. And so he blogs about you know, new things that are happening in, in, com in commercial development, but he also blogs about how that relates to the local residential real estate market to the point that he is now seen as the subject matter expert, the authority. So now people do bypass the forms and the engagements on his website and they literally email him or they call him and say, I've been reading your stuff for six months. You know what you're talking about. I'm coming to town. Let's go buy a house. Or yeah. you know what you're talking about. I've seen your market data. I've seen your videos. You know how to market homes. I want you to be the guy to list my home. And so that is the evidence right there. And I know it's hard, guys and gals, but if you can crank out really great content that really differentiates yourself there, that's the, that's the silver bullet right there. Hey, um, Dave, one of the things we had, or uh, no, I'm sorry, Bobby, one of the things we had talked about before, one of the things I'd seen on Google+, Plus, I think it was, um, I think you say Corrine in Barrington, Illinois, had done an infographic, maybe at your suggestion, that sort of featured, and I don't remember, that was three weeks ago, but featured where traffic came from on our website or what pe consumers liked about our website. Yeah. Um, you remember that, it, and it yes. was cool. It was like you could use the infographic to tell consumers why they ought to prefer your website. So, yeah. yeah, let me speak to that because it's really interesting. We, we helped Corinne Guest. She is a Barrington, Illinois real estate agent, does a bang-up job. If I was buying a home, there's a little commercial, I would definitely use Corinne, and then not because she was you know, a Dacno client or anything. She's just a, a smart gal, but um, she Absolutely. created... Yeah, yeah. She she created a an infographic using a tool called PictoChart, P I K T O C H A R T, PictoChart. And in that, what she did was aggregated all of her web statistics from 2013. And you want to aggregate it on the big level with big numbers because big numbers do what? They impress people. And so what you do is you aggregate all that data of, like for instance, we created one for a local agent here where she got traffic from all 50 states. Her website got traffic from like 14 foreign countries. So we put that front and center on that pictograph, on that, on that uh, infographic. We also put the number of annual visitors she got. We also put in there that she had a remarketing strategy where she had ads of her website appear at New York Times and Wall Street Journal and all these high profile online publications. Uh, we put how many uh, page views he had. So we would use all of that data that would like wow people to say, my gosh, you are dominant in online marketing. I got to list my home with you. And you use that in your listing presentations. Karen, you use that in a blog post. So you really show your online dominance by virtue of the, the stats that are already residing in your Google Analytics. So that that's, uh, seems a little bit counterintuitive. Like, you know, here's the back office stuff that I wouldn't think consumers that are coming to look for homes or find out home sales data. But I mean, this is what I love about it. It's like, okay, I'm going to expose, I'm going to open the books, so to speak, and give you proof of how awesome my website is. So maybe you don't like my picture, maybe my content isn't <laughs> wowing you, but maybe the numbers and the infographic you see somewhere is, you know, hitting a home run. You got to be careful with that because that can be a dual-edged sword. You make a great point there, Rich. So, I'm of the opinion in real estate marketing, you shine the spotlight on the strengths, on your strengths, and you mitigate or minimize your weaknesses. So, if you got a brand new site, do you want to go out and create an infographic that has zero traffic, you know, and nobody's ever come to your site? No, you don't want to do that. But if you're like like a Charlie, um, who is it? Charlie Dreesen, the guy in um, and Steamboat Springs that just creates these great, phenomenal real estate videos. They're amazing. They're amazing. They, they are, I, I don't know how it is that I was locked into a five-minute video about a house, but the kid just sucked me in, and then there I was 
the kid, I was like, kid, you don't need to move from this house. This house is awesome. Because the kid was basically ter- telling the story of the house. And so anybody out there, if you want to see an excellent video, uh, I believe it's Charlie Dreesen. Is that how, is that how you pronounce his name there? Steveboatsmyhome.com. Yeah. And it's also on, uh, because we were talking about that yesterday, Bobby, I put that on my uh, yeah. Google Plus profile page here. But, I mean, if, you, if you're straight, like Karen, Karen is, di- is diving. She's one of the, the 4% of agents. You talk about differentiating yourself. Karen is one of the 4% of agents that use video in their marketing efforts. That's a differentiating factor there. And so the way you leverage that is put that in your design, Karen, so that people know, like Charlie, hey, I crank out great content in video format. Take a look at it here and have a thumbnail or a, a player on your homepage where people can instantly click on that. So that is a great differentiator, isn't it? It really is. Awesome. So, um, you guys, it's probably time to start wrapping things up. I guess um, anybody have any questions for Bobby? Anything we haven't covered? Um, they want to go to uh, Karen. Let's start with you. Anything? Any final thoughts or questions? Yeah, um, the whole uh, aspect of website speed. I've been having a couple really hard weeks trying to get my speed. Down, I get yeah, get my time down. I'm down under three seconds. Um, how is that, and what should we shoot for? I guess that's actually a pretty good grade, Karen. So I, I give you okay. a hat tip for that. So that's really good. Here are the things, and David can can definitely speak to this as well, Rich. But the things that I look for in terms of uh, speed hogs, um, people who own WordPress sites are widget fanatics. Mm. My gosh, widgets will suck the life out of your speed of your site. So be careful not to over widgetize your, your sidebars. Um, not only that, but you're now relying on a third party in most of these cases with these widgets. And if those third party sites go down, then you could be sort of, you know, that could backfire on you. So be real careful about that. The other thing that I would tell you about, while, uh, I, and I don't have a soapbox for this, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm not a person that beats up on ZTR or anything like that, but if, you, if you're looking to sort of <clears throat> eliminate or cut the cord on SEO for those guys, get their widgets off of your site because you're just building backlinks for them. So a lot of people don't know that, but just, you know, basically eliminate those widgets off your site if you're not really looking to help promote ZTR and their efforts. The other thing that I would tell you to look out for, and John mentioned this earlier, is if you've got like nine images rotating in the background of your site, uh, that's probably sucking the life out of your speed. So unless those images are optimized, um, you want to make sure the images are optimized for rotation. But you know what? The reality is people don't come to your real estate website to watch your slideshow. If you think they're parking in front of your website to watch your pretty pictures flip through your homepage, you got another thing coming. They're not there to do that. They're making they're making decisions in nanoseconds, people. So don't load nine pages in the background and watch them flip. Excellent. How about you, uh, John Wake? Any final thoughts or questions? No, I just I was intrigued by what you were saying that there might be an update to Google. So I guess Dave, so you're going to be uh, keeping us updated on that on your blog or your absolutely. Website? Yeah, I won't, I'll put the word out on Google Plus and Facebook and whatever. Um, everybody will put the word out. You don't need to rely on me to do that. As soon as, as soon as Penguin is official or anything, you can bet everybody in my industry is going to need something fresh to talk about, and it will be a firestorm of activity. But you know what? It's probably not going to impact anybody here. Um, Very good. Excellent. Great. Hey, Rich, well, if um, I could, I want to give one little last tip, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Um, a lot of you folks out there in the real estate land love to have my featured listings with your listings rotating through um, some sort of widget on your homepage. And I know a lot of that is because of seller, uh, seller placation. You're basically placating to a seller. The reality is that's a pretty micro-targeting approach. Um, if you're going to have listings rotate through your site, please, please, please name that something more compelling than my featured listings because consumers could care less about your listing inventory. They're there to see all the listings. So if you want to say something like hot listings of the week or, you know, top, uh, top choices, you know, top choices for riches listings or whatever, but please make it very compelling. Make that headline compelling. Please don't use that mundane my featured listings headline because nobody cares. Yeah. 
Uh, okay, excellent point. I'm off to check my sites and see if I've done exactly that. Um, to check my site speed as well, Karen, thanks for bringing that up. I know when I was an early blogger, I didn't always resize my photos, and that can be a big suck on um, mm -hmm. load speed, etc. So, wow, this has been great, Bobby, Dave, John, Karen. Thanks, thanks for joining me, and um, I'm sure we're going to get a lot of views on this, Bobby. Um, you know, thank you for being uh, gracious with your time. Tell us how people can contact you if they're looking for a website and they like what they've heard from you. Thank you, and, and again, Rich, I want to say thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this great group of folks. Um, I'm Bobby Carroll. I'm with Dacno, D-A-K-N-O, Dacno Marketing. You can find us at dacno.com. We're a full-service real estate marketing firm. If you want to follow me on Twitter, my handle is R-E Web Coach. R-E Web Coach. I'd love for you to follow me there. Um, and I just love all things uh, online and social media. So if you want to connect with me in social media, I'd love to hear that. But you can connect with us through Dacno.com. All right. Excellent. On that note, we're going to end our broadcast for today. Um, thanks again, everybody, for being here. Have a terrific week. And we'll be back next Tuesday uh, with Lynn Pineda. Uh, talking about Pinterest for real estate. If you haven't seen Lynn um, around Google Plus, or if you haven't seen her on Pinterest, I don't know where you've been hiding because she is omnipresent. She does an awesome job and she's a, a wonderful lady too. So that's what's on tap for next week. Thanks again, everybody. Talk to you soon.